Today's species spotlight is another one that we try to do on location because I don't actually have it, but due to time constraints, we just did a ton of video of a bunch of different of my friend's species, and now we're gonna talk a little bit about here and overlay it again. So without further ado, let's talk about one of the strangest and coolest type of boas there are on the entire planet, the viper boa. So the viper boa are actually found on the island of New Guinea and a couple of the surrounding islands on both sides of the mountain range that break up the island, both West Papua and New Guinea. They belong to the genus called Candoya, which also a lot of other uncommon, fairly recognizable snakes like the Solomon Island ground boa, the Indonesian tree boa, and a few other different species all belong to. Now, obviously the viper boa gets its name because it looks like a venomous viper. And in fact, they think that it's evolution that it evolved to look very similar to the native venomous alapid, a type of death adder that they have on the island, which is funny because those death adders are also named after a viper, but they're actually venomous alapid as well. So both of them kind of stealing the name a little bit from other animals. Now, with that being said, unfortunately on the island and the surrounding islands as well outside of New Guinea, both the death adder and the viper boa are both killed because they are feared by the local populations, which kind of stinks. Um, that being said, they are still a really cool and beautiful boa. So when you look at them, you notice a couple things. Number one is the head shape that obviously it's very triangular. It's very broad. It's kind of pointy at the end. It looks almost very similar to the other Candoya species, but it's a lot wider and a lot more broad. And that is probably to help and aid in burrowing because a lot of the other ones do spend a lot of time in the trees and are a little bit more arboreal. And this one spends a lot of time underground under leaf litter, as well as also aids in that mimicry of the venomous snake as well. The rest of its body, it's very short. They rarely exceed lengths of two feet with females being larger. They're very chunky. They have very short tails, not really meant for climbing too well. And in fact, they share a lot of habits and similarities to blood pythons around Borneo and Malaysia and places like that, also in the South Pacific area of the world. Now, when you look at the animal outside of them being adorable chunky noodles, is that they're very, very variable in color. They can be almost a brown, a gray, highlights of red and orange. Some are almost bright red with yellow, and even there are some that are so dark they venture on black. The actual pattern of them stays fairly similar with very thin bars and banding and markings across their entire body, and essentially all that is to act as camouflage. They lay in the leaf litter, and that odd color not only helps blend it in, but the markings break up the shape of its body to also help blend in to guard against not only predators and people going to murder them because they think they're going to eat them, and their prey as well. They are ambush hunters, like most boa species, boas and pythons. They're not necessarily sit and wait, but these ones absolutely are. They take the kind of bushmaster approach where they blend in with the surroundings, they hang out for a while, and then when something comes along, they snag it. We don't actually know quite as much about these guys as we do a lot of the other types of species of boa, just because a lot of the animals that come from the New Guinea Islands and that area, we don't know quite as much about because it hasn't been as researched as a lot of, say, species in Central and South America. Now, with that being said, they do come out of there and they do have a really bad reputation, like a lot of the other snakes that come out of that, as being little chainsaws with no legs. Like, they're just firecrackers and they're always biting and striking. And I've even seen a couple, like, TikTok videos and YouTube videos of people, like, dancing around it and they're sitting there popping at them. But a lot of that comes from either, number one, they're antagonizing the snake to get the reaction from it, or number two, they're wild-caught animals. And that's where, for a long, long time, almost every animal that, specifically from that area, but viper boas, were all wild imports. They were either captive, they were either wild caught, or they came from farms where they were either born or they were raised and then they were brought in. And in fact, a lot of people would get in gravid females and they would have captive born babies. But unfortunately, when that happens, it's always very stressful. They're loaded with parasites. They don't really handle stress nearly as well as some other species of snakes to begin with. And so a lot of them didn't fare very well. So in addition to being chainsaws without legs, they also got a reputation as being very delicate and very fragile and very easy to die on people who were bringing them in, who not only didn't fully understand their husbandry needs, which even 
now is saying that we're still learning more and more about, but just couldn't have a snake being kept taken from such a stressful environment to begin with. Nowadays, there are quite a few people that are actually breeding them captively as well as there are some survivors from those captive born animals from those gravid females that come in to where they're actually starting to be a little bit more stable and less kind of bitey in general. With that being said, the, my friends who has been the predominance of this video doesn't react a whole lot. It's not really strikey. Um, she's brought them out to us to do in a couple different uh, large reptile shows when we do educational presentations. Sometimes I leave her in the little tub for kind of presentation purposes. Other times I'll actually pick her up. I say she, we're not really 100% sure, but doesn't really react. Honestly, she doesn't really move a whole lot in general. It's one of those type of snakes, at least in her care, has been an animal that is a nice, pretty expensive aquarium where a lot of time it spends either in the water or under the water. It'll be under the water dish, buried under the substrate for most of the time. It will come out, get into the water, shed, and then go back under. Even when feeding, it will come up, grab it, and then pull it right back under. So pretty, uh, pretty cryptic type of snake. They are really cool, and if you do in fact want to keep one as a pet, I absolutely number one, number one recommend that you get a captive born and bred little bit more stable, doesn't have that parasite load that you have to worry with, about, and treating parasites both externally and internally is also very stressful for that snake. So it's a whole other thing. That's why for the most part, I avoid wild caught animals in general, other than long-term captives. And then when you wanna keep it, they're a very small snake. So that means you don't have to have a huge enclosure, but not a 10 gallon tank. Come on guys, you, 10 gallons are yeah for 90% of the reptiles we have in the hobby. But a smaller tank, it doesn't need to be incredibly tall because they're not built for climbing. However, I would think that a couple of like the little half logs and very large low branches are good. Just because they don't always doesn't mean that they won't. Just like in the case of another popular snake that we've talked about to death at this point, just a good idea to give them a couple options. They like lots of humidity, and this is the part where it actually becomes a little bit difficult for a lot of keepers because it's very hard sometimes for people to be able to balance slightly cooler temperatures as well as very high humidity. That's when you run into a lot of respiratory problems, like what happens a lot with like the blood pythons and the short tail pythons and things like that, as well as rainbow boas as well. So you kind of need to know a little bit about reptile and snake husbandry before you get into it. Once you do have a pretty good grasp of actually how to do that, the actual care for them is relatively simple. That being said, always good to give a little bit of low level UVB light, like one of the low water chacadia, or the uh, early or the early morning or the first the first call geez I'm the bad brand ambassador but the first call uh, new uh, Vivtech LED UVA and UVB bulbs does really well does great for my uh, does great for a couple of my different frog species and it will be really good on an animal that is very nocturnal but still can absolutely very absolutely benefit from UVA and UVB lighting it's a really really cool species of snake. It's not one that I'll probably have on hand all the time, but it was really cool being able to go and visit with my friend who does keep such a wide variety of these different species and how she's actually able to take what are notoriously and sometimes earned grumpy little death and hate noodles and to create such amazing animals that can be great brand ambassadors as well as just ambassadors for snakes as a whole. At some point, She's working on her company name and logo and all that, and I'll be able to start tagging her down below and things like that. But I still have a few more species that are gonna be coming up for our species spotlights that we'll be highlighting of her really cool and beautiful animals. Hopefully you guys enjoyed today's video. I have a whole, whole playlist of species spotlight. I think this actually makes number 40. So over 40 different species of commonly and uncommonly kept different types of snakes that I talk specifically about, as well as I do plenty of other of the, like, the top five lists as well, and I have a whole playlist about that. Um, if you can, check out both of those playlists. Talks a whole lot about, learn a whole lot about. I have fun learning and researching about them as well, especially on the ones that I don't necessarily take uh, that I have in my collection, as well as learning more about the history, not only of the animals, but where they're from and their history and the hobby as well. It's really cool to learn and then share with all of you. If you can check those playlists out, it'd be great. Super appreciative. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, please let me know down below. You can always email me at jzsreptiles at gmail.com, jzsreptiles. I'll put a link down below, the same as the description of this video as well as all the other ones. 
everything like that. Hope you guys enjoyed this video. Hope you're having a great day and we'll check you next time.